Welcome to the FeeCast, your weekly dose of economic thinking from the Foundation for Economic Education. My name is Richard Lawrence. Today, on our final episode of the year, Aww. 2018, it's been a great year, we have our panel, Anna Jane Peril, Dan Sanchez, and Marianne March. Hello. Welcome all. <laughs> hello, hello. How does it feel to have come to this point in 2018, 30-some episodes into the FeeCast? Well, I'm a late joiner, um, so I would just say honored to be here. Um, you guys have made a wonderful, you've created an environment where I can ask as many cu- questions as I, as I want, um, and uh, I love hearing all of your voices, which are, you know, each have their own pitch, each have their own opinion. <laughs> yes, yes, and it's important that you mention pitch there, because of course, not only can people watch us, but they can also listen to us on not Spotify. Singing. No, not sing. <laughs> we're not going to sing. But we're on Spotify, we're on Apple, and we're also on Google. And so if you don't want to see Beard Watch 2018 progress into the 2019, you can just listen to the pitches and the sounds and the timbre and all the other vocal qualities that we deliver here every week on the FeeCast. Well, so this week, I'm going to open up our conversation with a question. Are you more or less likely to believe a study if it comes from an institution named Harvard University? Just Mm. out of the blue, knowing nothing else about the study, if it's attached to Harvard, is that something that makes it more believable or less? It depends on the department. I was going to say the same thing. (laughs) Really? I was going to be like, absolutely. Those are smarties. Okay, so departments that you lend credibility toward at Harvard. Right. Uh, So anything with the physical sciences, um, anything with the word critical studies in it, probably not so much. Okay. Wait, so why do you very, say that? Very oh. critical on critical studies? Yeah. Well, you know, any, anything where it, uh, it's just really dense jargon and, and um, obscurity and nothing's provable and there's no, it's just... And nothing is tested after it's published. Right, right. Let's talk about being uncritical. <laughs> what about you, Marianne? Harvard, yay or nay? I would my ears would perk up a little bit, but okay. then I think like Dan, it would it would depend on the topic. So the jury's out for you. You actually want to read the study before actually making a judgment about it, Anna Jane. On my best oh, day, yes. Yeah, I'm a, if we're Goldilocks, I'm definitely on the on the far end of I'll believe anything, whatever. Yeah, if it comes from Harvard, that must be right. Well, <laughs> so I wanted to ask that because we have a very popular piece on Fee.org this week, and it opens with Harvard study colon. Gender wage gap explained entirely by work choices of men and women. And this is by John Phelan, and it's getting a ton of traction Mm, on our site. And it's a big, big claim. And it seems like people are interested not only in the subject matter, but also the source. And what it basically finds is uh, in a working paper that some uh, scientists at Harvard issued recently— that looks at the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority, which is a heavily unionized, Mm rules-based shop, it finds that any kind of discrepancy between the wages of men and women is explained entirely, as the title mentions, by choice. Well, and it's a very controlled experiment because since it's such a a union shop, uh, everything is very regimented in terms of um, how how you can... um, climb the, the the hierarchy within within the system so so like there it's it's based on seniority it's right. just pure seniority and the seniority determines what kind of preference you get to exercise over the routes you take um, the whether whether or not you do overtime lot, there's there are choices within uh, working at, at the institution but uh, it's it's just based on seniority and so there's very little room for discrimination because there's very little mm. dis- discretion on the part so of So you're the basically inter- you're saying the pay is all based on seniority at, in this study. Uh, no, not not the pay necessarily. I mean the pay to, to some extent but the the choices of what kind of work you do. Mm-hmm. So so one one of the quotes that it says is that um, um, se- w- male and female workers of the same seniority have the same choices for scheduling, routes, vacation, and overtime. And um, and so what happens is that um, people make different choices about those things, and then it results in a difference in in pay. That the that um, female workers earn eighty nine cents. On, um, of the, on the dollar of male mm-hmm. workers. And so that 
says two things. Of course, it speaks directly to the commonly used number of the gender wage gap being 80 cents per every dollar. So in, mm -hmm. that, in that case, that women are making only 80% of what men are making. Um, but it also speaks to the fact that, indeed, there is a gap. This gap exists even when it is a tightly controlled uh, environment, such as a union shop where seniority isn't based on much preference that a boss might exert at all. And the point here is that there might actually be choices that at least these bus drivers are making, these uh, men and these women, that say, uh, you know, look, it's, if it's up to me, I as a bus driver am either going to take the harder routes and then not have to work as much time, or I'm going to work more time and do the easier routes. And when yeah, you for example, male and male train and bus drivers worked about 83% more overtime uh, than their female colleagues and were twice as likely to accept an overtime shift. Right, right. And so they accepted overtime, the men did, mm -hmm. as opposed to the women who just wanted to get work done with and, you know, they ended up making less for it. Or maybe they had other things to do at home. Right. So, <laughs> so one of the things that they said is that... Um, that parenthood turns out to be an important factor for the men too. That, fa um, but in in different directions. So fathers were more likely than childless men to want the extra cash from overtime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So family made them work more overtime, mm -hmm. wh whereas uh, mothers were more likely to want time off than childless women. That's interesting. So this all kind of flies in the face a little bit of what we've all been hearing for a long time, unless I assume you're under a rock, which is that there is a wage gap. It's seventy eight cents, eighty cents difference to a dollar, women making less than men. So basically mm -hmm. the study is saying, eh, not so much. Yeah. Well, and I think what the study is reinforcing is, and many other studies have, have posited this as well, that, again, it comes down to choice. The gap exists. But also the big thing that we need to take into account is that when you're looking at aggregates, you're not getting the full picture. You have to look yeah. at individuals at mm -hmm. whatever stage of life that they're in. Well, I remember, and this is kind of where I remember one of my first aha moments um, in my relationship to Austrian economics is I was in an econ class and we were talking about the wage gap and the teacher goes, you know, don't tell the ladies over in the women's studies department that uh, the wage gap is actually not what we think it is. Because if you talk about, mm -hmm. um, talk about individual choices and how that affects, I mean, and of course they break it down in the article that we posted in... Um, it, on fee, on fee.org, you can see kind of how that number, the traditionally talked about number has been arrived mm -hmm. at, and it's really rudimentary and it really isn't speaking to individual choice um, in the labor market. Right, because um, basically they just take the just all full-time workers mm -hmm. and the total pay for, for men and divide it by the number of full-time working men. Right. And then they do the mm -hmm. same thing for women. And so it's it's not disaggregated at all. Yes. Like it's not it's comparing apples and oranges. And it doesn't yeah, it doesn't take into account, I mean, individual choice. Um, and that was my first, again, my first aha moment that I realized that we can we can try and look at numbers and we can try and look at studies and the results of, of or we can talk about aggregates. Um, but one of the things that is fundamentally true is that humans are, it's a difficult thing. The human component will always be a variable mm -hmm. that's n not yeah. easy to measure. And there are a um, lot of different factors. You can't just say, pull a woman out of the population, yep. she makes this amount of money, pull a man out of the population, he makes this amount of money. Um, I actually had the opportunity when I was a student at Georgia State to take a class about policy data analysis. Mm -hmm. And we got up to the elbow in that data, running regressions and all kinds of linear things that I could barely repeat now. But Tell me the R squared later. <laughs> yes. And through getting into the data, I found that when you controlled for grades, for years of education, for federal experience, for the title of either a supervisor or a manager, once you control for all these different factors, the wage gap pretty much disappears. Yeah, exactly. And this is, there's a possibility for, for everyday people to to look at the numbers and see this kind of thing, but it's it's just so deeply ingrained in the culture that yes. there is a gap that yeah. even bringing it up is a little, ooh, like, can we, yeah, can so we even absolutely. discuss this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that you may you and I may feel this, like kind of like we're betraying our gender by suggesting that, okay, mm -hmm. this isn't the full picture, and we need to talk about choice. So, it, you know, what kind of career path are, are women versus men more likely to choose, and what what is, what are they, what's, what are they motivated by? Um, and is that something that is, you know, we're talking about socialized um, identity and behavior and also things that are maybe evolutionary, maybe, um, I mean, psychology, socialization, all of this stuff wraps into our individual choices. And it's so hard to measure um, and just say that it's a systemic problem. Right. right. right? Well, and, and it does go back to choice and, and also maybe some other factors, which we'll talk about in a bit. I think one of the most interesting things in that piece from my standpoint 
the one that I mentioned at the top, is that it details a couple other studies. There's one from the Institute for Women's Policy Studies, I believe it's called. Yes, the Institute for Women's Policy Research, and it basically does bad science. It basically combines, in a similar fashion to how mm -hmm. Dan mentioned, all the women working in the country and compares them against all the men working in the country, but it doesn't even look just at full-time jobs. It looks at people working part-time and even occasionally, and it finds, mm -hmm. magically, as you would expect, that the gap is even larger. And so I think there's a lot of difficulty with measuring this kind of thing, and it, it brings up all kinds of questions about, you know, what's the validity of looking at the aggregate for the entire population and trying to say that it then pertains to an individual. You can't find individuals represented in aggregate studies. It just does not exist. There's actually a, a fallacy. It's called the ecological fallacy. I discovered as I was preparing for today's show, it's the conclusion that what is true for the group is true for the individual. Mm -hmm. And the ecological fallacy doesn't really seem to play out all that often. Yeah. One interesting thing that I did find was that when we control for all these different things, the the gap becomes about 98 cents to a dollar, just a couple of cents different. But the gap widens back again when you're talking about executives. So I think there is still room to talk about to talk about that, about um, an underrepresentation of women in the very top pools of talent. And it is it is my personal belief that perhaps we we as women are still making making choices, as we've discussed, there's, um, there's a lot of temptation to, to leave the boardroom and go home. And, but I think that when we are comparing executive apples with other executive apples, there still is a little bit of a gap. So I don't know if we're out of the woods just yet. People mm -hmm. are people. Mm -hmm. Individuals are individuals. Mm -hmm. They're going to make different choices, uh, you know, between folks. So mm -hmm. let's, let's talk about the reasons for this gap. There are many ideas behind how this could uh, come about. You know, people say the good old boys club still rules in the boardroom and, and various mm -hmm. other places. That's obviously cultural, historical. What other reasons are there for this gap that we're really talking about quite often these days? Well, yeah, I want to highlight that, yeah, like you're saying, this is about how we as individuals make choices. I think just so much, and I have a background, so I mean, I studied economics, but I also studied gender and sexuality studies. So my my perception is definitely a, a sociological one in the sense that people are socialized around these values that we see. But I also think, so that's my perception is that we need to stop thinking about it as a systemic problem that is essentially an external force acting on us sure. and talk about how we all interact with each other. That's socialization. Right. How we exchange mm -hmm. values and how we promote our values, um, that's an individual choice. That's individual interaction. And so what I think we're seeing is the result of choices made based on social socialized values, um, which is women, and this is a, a, a deep a deep generalization, but a good to me, a good example sure. of what we're talking about when we talk about how it's not measuring the choice of a woman who may have been socialized her entire life to believe that caregiving is ideal. So she would go into a career as a nurse rather than as a doctor or, mm -hmm. you know, something like that where, or every woman in her family has been a nurse. So even if she has the medical, and even if she has the knowledge and the, you know, the intelligence to understand medical uh, practices, she may choose to go into nursing because, you know, because her family has done that or something like that, which again, generalization certainly, but I just wanted to kind of talk it through when you're talking about an individual, the values they've been socialized with, and the choices they make based on that. When you're well, talking about society, you're talking about generalizations. Unless you know these people, you have no other basis to go on. And then, and then with these generalized tendencies, that if, if to, to the extent that it's not socialized, um, it's going to um, have more of an impact out on the edges than uh, for the, the the bulk of the population. So, so for example, executives like like that is a very slim sliver of of the population making a whole lot of money. Mm -hmm. Right, right, and and so are like murderers. It's also a very slim <laughs> making uh, less money por <laughs> portion of the population. But, but then you find males way overrepresented among murderers too because mm -hmm. so there's a certain there, there might be a certain um maybe it's socialized may, maybe it's um maybe it's um, natural mm -hmm. uh, there, there there might be a certain tendency towards aggressiveness that 
uh, for the bulk of the population, it's not going to make that much of a difference between uh, the, the representation of men and women among different things. But among murderers, like, it makes a huge difference yeah. that, that, like, that small difference is going to really make a, a big difference in terms of how men are represented among murderers. Mm -hmm, and so, mm -hmm. so maybe it's the same kind of thing when you're talking about, like, super high competitive, high ag ag aggressive uh, you know, the, the ex executive realm that like a small difference in um, like psychological tendencies might have like a big a impact. A huge impact, yeah. yeah, to influence a statistic to a large degree, right, mm -hmm. for such a small population. Right. Yeah. Oh, and Leave I think it you're... to you to do the marginal yeah. analysis. I mean, that's <laughs> where a lot of the insight can be gleaned here. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that also, yes, and it's, it's you know, of course, just my background pushes me to say, oh, it's a socialization problem, but I think that Dan's pointed out some really good, um, some good points as well, which is when we talk about, you know, evolutionary psychology, that's, that's a challenging topic when you talk about what is a nature versus nurture a classic a classic argument and I think that it's just it's a it's a healthy mix of both um, and I think that we see um, yeah kind of overemphasized um, results of that on the margins is a really mm -hmm. good point one thing that we haven't touched on a lot yet is the amount of unpaid labor that women do in the home mm -hmm. Women are more likely than men to take care of things like cleaning and food preparation and just general child care, child care um, and things I've read on an average day, maybe three hours more a day women spend on these kinds of activities versus men. So I think that's kind of where a lot of a lot of the frustration might lie and where people would be more likely to accept a number like 78 cents. It's like, well, yeah, as, as a woman, I work hard at my job and then maybe I go home and then I spend time on activities that are beneficial to the home, but to the community and society at large that are unfunded and there's no, and how would you even go about funding that? I mean, we're not going to, how do you pay somebody to, you know, clean up after themselves? It's, it's kind of a weird idea, but but there is this difference in society of un of unfunded labor, and if people did have to start funding it, what would that mean? And mm -hmm. just any thoughts on that? Well, I think um, I mean I don't mean to be anecdotal again, but just thinking about and I hate to stress it again, it's a socialized value too. I think that women would be more likely because they are rewarded, not rewarded per se, but um, perhaps derive. Um, value or feel paid by the experience of taking care of the family mm -hmm. from a socialized perspective. So they are that yeah. they've been socialized to believe that maybe their role is part as a caretaker. Not that not that men are not socialized that way. Um, but I would say more so and again, huge generalization, maybe that's what women experience, at least in our culture. Um, I know my dad, you know, he definitely felt the most good about taking care of his family when he was working long hours, which is so different than thinking about my mom who was willing mm -hmm. to take a lower paying job so she could have more flexibility to come home. Yeah. Um, um, which is, again, two expressions of love, of care, um, but look very different, especially when you're talking about pay. I think it would mm -hmm. be foolish to fall into the trap of trying to explain every part of human behavior, especially in the home with loved ones, in economic terms, right? I think there is something to the notion, however, that there's some value being created, mm -hmm. even if it's unpaid labor mm -hmm. around the house, mm -hmm. Uh, by that type of work. And I tend to think too, I mean, when it, you just have to continue going back to choice. Yeah. You have to continue going back to what do people who, you know, either have a long term ho homemaker job, uh, mm -hmm. what's going through their minds? I mean, is this something that uh, makes sense for them? I would think, unless it's an abusive situation, of course there are those, that in most of those cases, that this is obviously something that they choose to do, that they feel compensated for, maybe not monetarily. And, and maybe, yeah. again, that's not the right way to look at it in economic terms. But, you know, the ties that bind family together are obviously valuable in and of themselves. Like a love, Another, curren a love currency. Sure. Right. I mean, that is a, you're, it's a value you're being given. Well, yeah. And, and the way that compensation actually, um, what it's ultimately for is for higher living standards. Um, and, and the thing, so I think so, that's a great point, Dan, it's not compensation for the sake of compensation. That's what, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the pay gap and the, the income gap and, and wage disparities and income inequality, it all goes back to what you're saying right here. It's Wait, not pay mean? for pay's sake. Right. That, that the, the, the reason why we want to be paid money for work is so that we can uh, increase our quality of life mm -hmm. so that we can buy um, buy goods that make life easier and more comfortable and, enjoy and enjoyable and, and fulfilling and um, and and the thing about um, about household 
labor is that it, it still creates that, but more directly. Mm. So, so just the, the, the labor creates like a um, higher quality of living uh, directly. And so, so it, it ultimately translates to the same thing, oh, I see what you're but, saying. Through, yeah. but not through the money nexus. Your quality of life, yeah, is, is increased or preserved based on that labor, and it's not just the money is the middleman that speaks to that. But I see, but and then in this is more direct. Right, you can't eat cash. You can't right. yeah. cash. Mm -hmm. Cash does not, in and of itself, make a beautiful place for you to live. Mm -hmm. So I've got a question for you. So of course we're talking a little bit now over the past couple minutes about homemakers, right? People who choose to do work in the home and and not get paid for, at least not directly, right? But should women who choose not to work in the home be I suppose, punished by sort of the uh, expectation that uh, their their peers who work in the home have set, meaning should women have to put up with lower wages of whatever amount, even if they don't choose to work in the home at all? Does that question make sense? Uh, so you're saying that it, regardless of my personal choice to have a family or to contribute any, to even clean my house, whatever, um, if I don't need that extra time or I don't need that flexible schedule, shouldn't I be paid more because I don't need, you know what I mean, taking the lower yeah. paying job yeah. to speak to that? Um, I don't know. I hate saying should. I don't like shoulds. That's a really, <laughs> I don't like phrasing questions that way. Um, I don't know. That's a hard question. Hmm. A working woman's out there, and she's chosen to dedicate her life to a paid career outside of the home, and yet she's still bound by this social expectation that mm -hmm. women don't work out of the home as much. If I'm going to should, I would say uh, individuals should be compensated based on market prices, regardless yeah. of whether or not there's, yeah, that's, there's social expectations. I do, I do feel that we've shifted a little bit away from that being the norm, the kind of the premise that you're basing your question around. I think that these days it's maybe the opposite. I think that women, there's a greater expectation that women will do everything, that we will be rock star moms at every soccer game, but also kicking butt in the boardroom right. and also looking good while we do it. Mm -hmm. There's There are these different kinds of pressures. So I don't even know... I don't think that there's a judgment about leaving the home, if that's what you're saying. I think it's maybe a little bit more the opposite, that women are probably more likely to be judged for for just working in the home only. Does that answer your question, Richard? It might. It might. It's a <laughs> tough thing. And so, yeah. you know, of course, it's obviously something we're talking about. People are talking about it. I think mm -hmm. Ivanka Trump has uh, some uh, thoughts on how to address these issues, whether they exist to what degree or not. Mm -hmm. So what are the solutions? I mean, what would what would the fee gang, the fee cast gang here say if, you know, we, we have this problem, let's just accept that for right. argument's sake. Mm -hmm. How do we address it? Yeah. Well, I'm going to jump in. I, I, you know, again, as I'm saying, if I perceive socialization as the key problem or at least the only thing we can control and identify is the social component where we're socializing certain values in this culture – if you want to fix that and you want to take a free market approach um, and you don't want you don't want the government to, to have to be responsible for fixing this problem, um, my solution would be, okay, I am, um, I'm going to lean in. I really care about other women oh, you're leaning hear, in. hearing that <laughs> message. I care about that. I am going to start Anna Jane Perrell's Foundation for the Progress of Women, <laughs> and I am going to get all of my donors who are, you know, providing their funds willingly to... Yeah, buy lean in for, you know, for girls, for high school girls, or, you know, start a really cool marketing campaign that speaks to the social values around women as executives or something like that, right? You, you, I think that you create resources and access to information that either changes the conversation or encourages social behavior in the direction you want it rather than creating prohibitions or creating regulation around it. You mm -hmm. it, you empower people to make their own decisions by providing resources that you feel promote the values you want society to to value. So you would develop individual women instead of trying some massive society wide campaign Either or one. government. Well, <laughs> see, not see. I feel like you can still do massive campaign. Um, but you can do that with the free market, right? You, I can create uh, my organization where my donors are, like I said, giving us money freely, and then we're going to create a national campaign. You can do that, but I don't think that that's the government's responsibility. And ultimately, I mean, like we all would agree, I don't think the government would do it most efficiently. All right. So equal pay for equal work laws, yay or nay? Mm -hmm. I don't like Big Brother looking at my stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know the IRS pretty much already knows about my financial they know situation. Everything. 
But I don't like the idea of being forced to give up that information in, in a different setting outside of the IRS. I mean, I don't like to give it up to the IRS. So let's begin. Let's be honest. But um, so I think when you say there ought to be a law, you're yeah. saying there ought to be a lot of bureaucrats running around with a lot of power to tell me what to do. And I don't like that. So I, I think I kind of take a page out of Anna Jane's book. And actually, if, if, if you'll allow me, I would like to just address the audience for a moment. Go get your money. Mm -hmm. Go ask for a raise. Yeah. Women, if you're listening, we all, we have to take some personal responsibility for being tenacious and for taking control of our financial lives. And I think that since we've spent a lot of time talking about the individual versus the aggregate, let's talk about some individuals. First line supervisors of retail sales workers. These are the most likely people to earn less women in these positions are more likely to earn less than their male counterparts versus other industries. So first line supervisors of retail workers, go get your money. Mm -hmm. We've got to, we've got to play it where it lies. And yeah. if there are specific industries that are more guilty of paying people different wages than others, let's start there and start with talking to those people. Yeah. And it's a conversation also. So if we're talking about, um, yeah, we, every time you say there ought to be a law, you're doing it. What is it at the barrel of a gun? Mm -hmm. I love, I love that. I mean, that's the reality <laughs> what it is. Um, and so, uh, theoretically, if a company wants to hire good employees or wants to create an environment where people want to stay long term or be good employees, you'd say, okay, we're going to have a, you know, an, uh, salary transparency, uh, policy. But again, that's an, that is to me a private organization's decision. Um, and it could be in their interest to do that, to encourage those conversations. What would you say about the people mm -hmm. who would argue against sort of what each of your approaches would be, which are mm -hmm. very similar, I think, in nature. Mm -hmm. You're instructing women to go out and get it, negotiate, actually mm -hmm. take their career by the horns and, and just, you know, get what they need. Yeah. And I'm not saying that's easy, but I, I would imagine it's not easy for, for a lot of men who engage in salary negotiations either. There's plenty of blogs out there. You can read, get some good tactics. There's ammunition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and individual women and, and men too can take that advice to heart and actually act on it. That's small scale, yeah. right? So that takes yeah. it takes people it doing it one-on-one. On one. When we're talking about individuals, it's all small scale. All politics is local. Mm. And then your your education campaign with the Anna Jane Peril uh, <laughs> Foundation for Empowering Women, yeah. that's going to take a while, right? Right, right? Okay, so small scale, take a while. So there are people who, for very legitimate and earnest reasons, want to have the federal government say, if you are a teacher of three years, you should be paid precisely the same amount, whether you're a man or a woman. What's wrong with that kind of law? So philosophically, we've said we don't want anyone forcing us to do that. So but sometimes force can make better choices. I'm putting question marks on that, <laughs> you know, it's an interesting thing because that seems to be a solution a lot of people are pushing toward these mm -hmm. days. Well, like the same job description is not necessarily the same uh, what what is being paid for. Because again, like it, it all depends on what people on the market are willing to mm -hmm, pay. Mm -hmm. and, and ultimately it comes down to, to the consumer. It's it all, ultimately it comes down to whether... Um, the output of of this production is is satisfying consumers in a way that's that's making people's lives better that that they're willing to pay for, and um and so so the same so so it, it just just because it's the same job description doesn't mean that there's the same productivity sure it, the value productivity sure mm -hmm. it's interesting too because one of my favorite economists uh, who's actually on our wall behind Anna Jane uh, Nobel laureate Milton Friedman. He has a video on uh, YouTube. He didn't put it up there. It's of him. And it basically, uh, in it, he's posited with the question, you know, why not equal pay for equal, equal work kind of legislation? Why not? He says, what you're doing, not intentionally, but by misunderstanding, when you try to get equal pay for equal work laws, is that you're reducing to zero the cost imposed on people who are discriminating for irrelevant reasons such as race or gender or whatever. And I would like to see a cost imposed on them. And so the, the point that he's saying is when you make it illegal to have different wages for, for the same work, you are therefore removing any bargaining power that the person that the boss uh, might be discriminating mm -hmm. against had to get the job in the end. I You're see. basically reducing to zero the tax they have for discriminating. 
And I think that's just mm-hmm. a brilliant way of looking at sort of the unintended consequences right. behind a yeah. piece of legislation. So, like so the that. way that might play out might be if Dan and I both apply for the same job and the person who's hiring maybe has a preference for hiring male employees. If I can't bargain on my salary, then I don't stand a chance. Is that what? That's it. That's well, exactly okay. right. Well, and, and also, if if he chose me for mm-hmm. that arbitrary reason, that's going to affect his the, the um the, the business's success. Yeah. Because if you mm-hmm. were more productive than me, yeah. but he chose me anyway, that his business is going to suffer that for would, that. that. And, would be and my then point, someone yeah. who is mm-hmm. not arbitrary, uh, they're, they're, they're going to do better because the c- consumer, ultimately, they, they look and they, they care about quality and, and price. Mm-hmm. And the person who made the non-arbitrary economic decision is, uh, is going to be able to compete better. And the consumer is going to choose that person. That's the kind of uh, discrimination that ultimately the consumer has that reduces arbitrary discrimination just based on on arbitrary factors. Yeah. Let's all say it all at once. It's Dan's favorite concept, consumer, consumer sovereignty. sovereignty. <laughs> what were you saying? Uh, I was going to say that, I mean, yeah, like, like Dan was saying, um, it, it ultimately, especially in a context now where everything is so public and every decision made by every company is analyzed mm-hmm. by people who care um, on Twitter, by every single individual, um, and you are a profit-seeking company, you are motivated not to not to be discriminatory based on arbitrary reasons. Yeah. We just have so much information these days that we can employ to make those decisions that if we sense the slightest bit of sexism, racism, homophobia, whatever, exactly. we can choose the person who's not or the, bo- the boss or the company that's not exercising those prejudices. Yeah, and with, and with I think, and kind of what you're saying is that, and if we do an equal pay, if we institute some sort of equal pay law, we have now leveled the playing field for both morally objectable companies, if that is what they are doing and that's how you feel, um, and good companies. And so you're giving them an equal playing field to be successful when in reality, maybe they should be, maybe they should incur a cost based on- You're giving on, them an out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you guys believe in your power as individuals, wouldn't you want the, the playing field to be um, not necessarily level based on a law, but um, right. reflective of reality so ul- that you can make good decisions? Ultimately, you can't coerce people to be moral, to right. be good. Mm-hmm. Like if anything, all, all you're doing is- taking away from them the responsibility to choose to be moral. Yeah. And so that's why a lot of people say like, no, I want to know who the bigots are out there. Yeah. Out there. So, mm-hmm. so that if, if, if like someone is a bigot, but then that never gets revealed because they have, they're forced to uh, hire in non-bigoted ways, then they never actually uh, learn to not be a bigot because they never actually have to pay <laughs> for the bigotry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, we are not going to force our watchers or our listeners to listen or watch us anymore because we have to wrap it up. But it's been a great conversation and it's been a great year. So thank all of you for everything. And of course, Brittany and everyone who was part of our panel ahead of time. Uh, And we look forward to seeing everyone in the new year of 2019. Again, check us out on Apple, Google and Spotify and have a great year, everybody. Thanks for watching. 